So last problem that we're going to do will of course have a hollow interior, but uh, I want you to graph the region out and then look at the region and see why it will have a hollow interior when you look at where it's rotated. Oh, I should turn the screen on. So our region on this will be y equals x squared and y equals 2x. And we're going to revolve or rotate revolved about the y-axis. I'm not sure we need the first quadrant restriction. All right, so go ahead and graph out this region right here. Any questions about the region before we go and rotate it? So why is there going to be a hollow interior? We're touching the axis right here at the origin. But as long as there's one place we're not touching the axis of, of rotation, we're going to have a hollow interior. So all this, when we rotate all that part up there, is going to be the hollowness. So let's rotate. So we'll extend our y-axis, our rotation axis, down. And just like we did before, we're going to draw two copies of this. One copy on the side it's already on, and then a mirror image copy. So these regions that are a little more complicated, when you draw it, you either need to be a really good artist and use shading or be able to use your imagination, one of the two. Because we're, we're trying to draw three dimensions on a flat piece of paper. <clears throat> so once we do this, we're going to need a cross section. How do I draw my cross section? What, what type of a cut or a slice do we need to make with the plane? So we got a horizontal. So perpendicular to our axis, so it'll be a horizontal plane. So I'm just picking some point on the axis, and then I'll draw what that cross section looks like. Now this one's a little tricky, and I probably drew it too small, but our cross section will look like an annulus now, or a washer. There's a interior hollow circle, and then uh, if I try to shade it in, this probably won't work out so well. So it's called an annulus or a flat donut. So it's a circle with a hollow interior, but it has some thickness to it. Oh, that actually doesn't look too bad. Oh, I'll, leave, I'll leave that shading on there. All right, so that's the shape we have. And we have a little radius and we have a big radius. 
I think I drew this way too small, so you can't zoom in. So uh, I'll draw the cross section next to it, and I'll draw it bigger. So our two radii, and let's do those in red. Now I'm going to draw them on the right side, because if I go to the original, I see that it's all on the right side. So I'm going to draw this on the right side. So we got one radius that goes here. That's the little r. And a big radius that I'll draw right next to it. And that's capital R. So we've got a little r and a big R. So let's take those radii back to the original. Um, I don't think I need to draw the cross section itself. Well, I'll do it anyways, because we've always done it. So you can draw it much bigger, and you got your little r and your big R, like that. So we got little r and big R. So now we're going to trace those radii back to the original function, the original region. So going to the original region, that's little r and big R. Goes, and you're always going from your rotation axis out to generally one of your curves, one of your functions. Well, I don't want to call them functions because they may not actually be functions of x or y. You could be using, we did a circle before, which is not a function of either variable. So any questions about those radii when they come back to the original? So is this going to be, so we got our x-axis and our y-axis. Is this a uh, dy integral or is this a dx integral? dy. So why is it a dy? Because it's above the y-axis. Mm, no, if it was below the y-axis. About. Because we're rotating about the y-axis. And the way we cover this entire region, if we're squeegeeing, our squeegee is horizontal, so I have to change my y-coordinate and go vertical. Or, if you want, the thickness of this region is measured in y's, so it's some tiny amount of y thickness. So it's a dy if you measure how thick it is. All right, so we know these are now functions of y. Now I'm making a big deal because if you write r of x, these as functions of x, you're not going to get the right answer at all. So if you write these as functions of x, it's going to be, uh, you're already starting down the wrong path. So it's going to be very hard to give you points for doing that. So big minus small. So in this case, it's a big y minus small small y and same thing Ooh. let's not write the y down there let's go big minus small all right big radius we'll go capital r first and let's label some more stuff on this curve or on this we'll label the actual curves themselves this is y equals x squared, and the other one was 2x. All right, so big minus small. So big x squared minus small, which is 0. So what did I do wrong? So I got the right curve, but I wrote it as a function of x. Not a, I need to write it as a function of y. The 0 is OK. We're going uh, 0 is the small. Uh, y value. Except I can't use x squared. So how do I find a function of y? So we're solving, so solving for x, so just square root both sides. Now, when you do that, you get plus or minus square root y equals x. How do I know to go with the plus or the minus? So remember our parabola keeps going up. The original parabola keeps going up. Yeah, the left side would be all the negative x values. The right side's all the positive x values. So I want to make sure x is positive, so I better go with the plus. Remember, just looking at this, y is never negative, or you've got complex numbers. So y is not going to be negative. It's x that could be negative. So we ensure that it's positive by just choosing the positive one right there. We don't need that guy. 
So we're going to use square root y. So we got square root y minus 0 for our big. And I want you to figure out the small, the little r of x. And I'll give you a hint. It is not 2x. It's also not 2y. So this is the wrong answer. So figure out what needs to go right there. So you got to solve for x, and you get one half y. All right, so we got our big R and our little r. All we have to do is put it into the equation for the volume, which is right up there. So you can go with either one. I'm going to go with the second one, just save a little time. You can absolutely go with the first one if you want to. Make sure you square correctly. If you don't use parentheses on that half y squared, it'll look like you're only squaring the y. So it's not a good time to mess up with algebra. So we got our two, our big R, little r. What about the small and large y values? So the bounds of our integral. Zero and two. Not, so we got to go y values, remember. Yeah, so we're going to go 0 up to 4. So just think you're using your squeegee. If you don't go from 0 to 4, you're going to have a dirty spot in your window. So you've got to go all the way 0 to 4. And it seems a little silly to think about squeegeeing a window, but I'm telling you it's going to work. You think about your bounds when you do it. Oh, I need to go from the bottom to the top. And it also helps you figure out you have a dy integral, not a dx integral. So we'll square these out. So the first one is perfect. That's just a regular y. Minus 1 fourth y squared dy. How do we integrate this? This is an easy integral. So you can split it up, or you can just do anti-power rule on each term, basically. So add one of the power, divide by the new power. So I'm not going to finish off this integral. Just going to go dot, dot, dot. So this is a calc 1 integral right here. So that's the end, uh, or that's the last problem I'm going to do with the uh, washer or the disk method, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, so if you don't have a good graph. Yeah. So how do we get the 4? We need to intersect those two okay. right there. So let's just use algebra and forget about that graph completely. Uh, so let's find their intersections. And there's actually going to be two intersection points. So let's uh, find both of them. So we're solving a system. We have y equals x squared and y equals 2x. So there's a few ways to solve these. Uh, there's substitution and elimination, basically. If they're linear, you could uh, use a matrix. But generally, I'm not going to give you a linear system overall. They'll usually be quadratic, square root, something like that. Uh, there could be some trigonometry, too, if I uh, feel like working that, that out to get nice intersection points. So how do we intersect these? Let's go elimination. How can I eliminate y very easily? Subtract the two equations, y will disappear. 
So let's go ahead and do that. So subtract, we got 0y equals x squared minus 2x. So 0 equals x times x minus 2. x equals 0 or 2. Now, why did I subtract, why did I make the second equation negative instead of the first equation negative? Well, that was a choice that I made. What if I do the opposite? So if I add these two together, I still get 0. Oops, that should be an x squared. But now I have negative x squared plus 2x, which factors as x times negative x plus 2, and x equals 0 or 2. So either way you go, you get the same thing. Uh, this doesn't tell me y values, and actually the x values are not what I technically never needed to find these x values. but we'll use these to get y's. And it's very easy, you can use either equation that you want to uh, find the y values. The second one's slightly easier, so we'll just plug that in. So we got two answers, y equals 2x, y equals 2 times 0, y equals 0, or y still equals 2x. So there's our 0, 4 right there. Any questions on the algebraic intersection of these? Now, I want to warn you, just because these two intersect in two points doesn't necessarily mean that these are your min, max, y values. For example, if I also um, had an inequality that was, let's say, y is less than or equal to 1, I would have a vertical line, y equals 1, and I'd be concerned with the bottom part. So if there's more than two, uh, you have to know what the shape looks like because there's going to be, there would be three intersection points and that other one would no longer count. So when there's more than two, things get a bit more complicated. That's why you really need to know the shape of the region that you're working with. Uh, you can still find all the intersection points with algebra, but it might be an intersection point that you don't need. So you might get an extra intersection point that doesn't happen to have anything to do with the boundary. So there's two ways. You got illumination or substitution. I think more people go substitution route. That's totally reasonable, however you want to go. So our next session, we're going to do still volumes of revolved uh, regions. So these are going to be solids of revolution. They're going to look exactly like these ones. The only difference is we're going to cut it up differently. So instead of cutting it and making circles, we're going to cut it a different way. And we better be careful about how we're going to cut it. We do want to have nice, these won't actually be cross sections, but it will serve the same purpose. So we'll write down the problem that we're going to uh, find the volume for, and then write out how we'll break it down and come up with the formula. So this is going to be a region that is bounded by this equation and also bounded by quadrant 1, which means x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than or equal to 0. 
So sometimes you won't see the actual equation or an inequality. You'll see something written out. You're in quadrant one, or you're above the x-axis, or to the left of the y-axis. What type of graph do I get from this equation? So it'll be a sad parabola. So you've been studying parabolas for probably years. You should be experts in parabolas by now. So we got a parabola, a sad parabola. Let's, uh, we're in quadrant one. So let's worry about the x-intercepts. That'll be right on the boundary of quadrant one. And I want to go to graph paper. How do I get the x-intercepts right here? <laughs> Syntite. How do you get the x-intercepts? Plug in zero. Plug in zero for what? X. For, so plug in zero for, so if you're on the x-axis, <coughs> your y-coordinate will be zero. My favorite F word, factor, <coughs> some tight. So we got x times 3 minus x. So we got 0 and 3. Those are the two x intercepts. 0, 3. We have a sad parabola. I might need to figure out the maximum height. How would I figure out the maximum height? So I take derivative set equal to zero. That'll give me the x coordinate of the height, of the maximum um, height. What about parabolas? What's right in between zero and three? 1.5, that'll be also the vertex, because parabolas are symmetric. So we could use some pre-calculus knowledge as well. So either way, you could find the height either of those two ways. So negative b over 2a will give you 1.5. And then you just plug that in, or three halves. So I'm going to plug in three halves into the equation. So we have three times three halves minus three halves squared. Nine halves minus nine fourths. which is nine, nine fourths. I'm being lazy with my denominators, but 18 fourths minus nine fourths is nine fourths. So that's a little bigger than eight fourths, so right about there, nine fourths. So there's our parabola. Right there. I may not need 9 fourths, but depending on which way I cut this up, I may need the maximum y value. And we're going to rotate about the line x equals negative 1. So this shape, when we rotate, it's going to be very hollow. It's not even touching the rotation axis, so it's going to be um, hollow for sure. What shape does this form? There's a special name for this kind of cake. Oh, those are delicious, but it's not funnel cake. I think it's a bunt cake. I don't know what a bunt is, but I know what a bunt cake is. So just draw two copies of this. There's our shape right there. 
Or a half a donut. It's a weird half to eat, though. All right, so we're going to, normally we would cut in what direction if we were using the methods from last section? How would our planes cut through? Horizontal. Horizontal. Let's not do that, though. So how else can we cut this shape up so that each uh, section has a similar and nice shape to it? So if I just come in with a vertical slice like this, some parts will have some weird shape. Some parts, as we get to the middle, will have two pieces to them. So this is not going to be very good. If I do some vertical cuts, every piece is going to look a bit different. So that's not a good way to cut it. So we're going to have to think outside the box a little bit. What we're going to do is cut this with cylindrical shells. So think about, you're not cutting with a plane now, you're cutting it with a cylinder. And each cylinder cut is going to have a different radius size. So we're going to cut with cylindrical shells. So what we're going to do, just like before, I'm going to draw a cross section, and I'll draw it in blue. So our cross section is going to be now parallel with the rotation axis. This is the opposite that happened last time. Last time we cut it with perpendicular to the rotation axis. So we're going to cut it parallel this time. And what shape, when I rotate my cross section, what shape does that form? So you're just taking a cross section and you're rotating, you're going to get a cylinder. So our cross section is perpen uh, parallel with our rotation axis. So you're just going to rotate around and get a cylinder. So we'll draw that cylinder down below. And we of course, get another copy on the other side. So are there any questions on this cross section turning into a cylinder? Now if I take any other cross section over here, it's also going to turn into a cylinder. So every single cross section, no matter which vertical piece you take, they're all going to turn into cylinders. And that's very important. You need every shape to have, uh, every rotated cross section to have a similar shape. So they're all going to turn into cylinders. Or does cylinder have a hole in the middle? Oh, it definitely have a hole in the middle, yeah. So now we need to measure this. and figure out what is the volume. Now, our cross sections, they have a thickness. They have a width. What do we call that width right there? So in our case here, that width is going to be called dx. So super tiny, and it's a little bit of um, x. You're going to travel a little distance on the x-axis, so we call that dx. So now what I'm going to do is draw. I'm going to try to draw this with some amount of thickness to it. So I'm going to have a little bit of thickness right here. I'm just going to trace out some shape. And the way we're going to measure the volume of this shape right here, it's super thin, but you can't say that it's zero thick. So it's very thin. What we're going to do is we're going to basically think about cutting it in one place and then opening it up, sort of like a laser.
label on a soup can. You can make a slice. It doesn't have too much glue on it, and you can pull it off easily. You can make a vertical slice, and it just lays out into a rectangle. So that's all we're going to do. So just cut it vertically in one place, and we're going to look at it like a rectangle. It's pretty boring when you look at it like a rectangle. It does have some tiny little bit of thickness, which now we can try to draw in here like that. So it has some depth to it. So how do I get the volume of this shape right here? So there should be three things multiplied together. So we got the height times width times, and the depth, I'll use D because that's going to be just DX. So that's how thick this thing is. Super tiny amount, but it's going to be DX. So height times width times depth. Uh, so we need to know what's the height, what is the width. We already know what type of an integral we have. It's already fixed. What type of integral do we have? How do I squeeze? So I'll trace my cross section back to the original. How do I squeegee this region? Change your x right there. So change your x. This is going to be an x integral or a dx integral. So I need an h of x function and a w of x function right here. So I need both of those two. And our width is just, or our depth is dx. So where does our height come from? If you look over here, our height is that vertical measurement right there. So tracing the height all the way back up, the height is the measurement that we were concerned with before, basically. How tall is that original cross section? So for this problem, we got big minus small. So in our case, our big was y equals 3x minus x squared. It's already a function of x. I don't have to mess around with solving for x. So we got big minus small. Solving for x would not be fun. You would get a plus minus square root in there. You have to complete the square and all that fun stuff. Um, so big is 3x minus x squared. What is the small? Zero. Yeah, zero. No matter where you are, it's going to be zero. All right, so that's our height of x. And this is exactly the way we'd measure before, except we're going to rotate, we'd be rotating the other direction. So this is a lot like our cross section from the first time. Now we're going to deal with the width. So we see how to get the height. It's similar. The width is a little bit more tricky. Let's think about where that width comes from. When we cut it into a rectangle, we call it the width. What property of this cylinder does the width represent? The circumference of the circle. And that's the circumference. So we need to know what is the circumference of this cylinder right here. So we look over here. W of x is the circumference. So, so that would be 2 pi r. That is circumference. So I know 2, I know pi, all I need to know is r. So what is the r measurement? Let's, I'll use red. We've been using red for radius before. Let's go ahead and use it now. So we go all the way up to here. That is R. So R is going to be another uh, big minus small, definitely. Now we need R. It looks like R should be a function of Y. R needs to be a function of X, or we're not going to be able to integrate it. 
So it needs to be a function of x. All right, what is, easy question, what's a small value for r? Negative 1. Negative 1. So no matter what, we're stopping at negative 1. Now the big is kind of tricky to see. The big depends on where our cross section is. When we're integrating, x is going to go from 0 to 3. And it's going to have some x value in between. So x is the big. Whatever x value you're working with is the big. And that's a little tricky to see. So the way I drew this here, that's just some x value between 0 and 3. So that is the big. So that's a little bit tricky to see. You just need to do some problems and in this section, and it'll become a little bit more clear. So for this one, it's going to be x plus 2. Whatever your x value is, oh, plus 2, plus 1, wow. Whatever your x value is, one more is the radius. And you can see that from the picture. Whatever x value you're thinking of, it looks like I was thinking of, I don't know, maybe 2 right here. So my radius in this picture would be 2 plus 1. That would be that radius right there. So ready to bring all this together. Somewhere, here we go. So our height, oh. That was r. Oh, we did completely didn't finish this off. So we take our r of x that we just got up there which was x plus 1. Now we can put everything together. So the height was somewhere 3x minus x squared. Times 2 pi x plus 1 dx. So this is the volume of one shell, and uh, the total volume is the volume of all the shells added together. So we just put it in an integral and figure out the correct bounds. And what are the bounds? The bounds are x values, because we have a dx integral. So what are the bounds here? So if you want to squeeze your, your entire region, your whole window, don't miss the corners, what is the minimum x value? Zero. 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 Maximum x value? Three. So you've just got to squeeze. Don't go negative one to three. Uh, if you use negative one, you'll probably be counting all this area and revolving that around. So if you use negative one, you'll get something extra, and you'll probably get all that down there. So we're going zero to three. And of course, that two pi, no matter what, you're going to get that two pi. Might as well bring that out front. Now, if I was integrating this, you, of course, FOIL, and then you just have a polynomial to integrate. So in general, this is volume equals, you got your 2 pi outside. So it'll be r times h, radius times height, just like we constructed. We don't have to subtract the 
Uh, the what? Ah, that's a good question. So this has hollowness to it. Definitely, a big part of this is hollow. Let's think about the way we slice this up. Did we count the inside area? So I'll draw a bunch of cross sections and think about how these cross sections rotate. These will represent pretty much all the cross sections there are. If you think about these rotating, they never rotate into that hollow space. So we basically completely avoided having to remove a piece later. The problem when we're using the washers, uh, you have to, you know, if you measure from your rotation axis all the way over, you'll cover that hollow space. So you either have to, you have to account for that. So that's why we had to go with two of them. So there's the benefit for the other system is if it's not hollow, it can be faster. Um, this one can be slower, but it all really depends on the shape and your original functions. There's a lot of um, things that determine what's the best method to use. So if you are sh rotating about the x-axis, we just rotated about the y-axis. So what I wrote above is, general, in general, that will always work. You just have to figure out as a dx or a dy integral. If you know you rotate about the y-axis, you can write out your volume, 2 pi integral a to b. You'll have an h of y function, and you'll be multiplying by y dy. And if you rotate, rotate about the x-axis, it's going to look very similar. You'll have your height of x. Now this is going to be sideways, except I'm going to call it height because your cross sections are going to look like this. So when I say height of x, that's it's a sideways height. But as far as the cylinder is concerned, the cylinder will call that the height. It would not say that's the radius. And then the radius will be that vertical measurement right there which in this case, that'll just be x. Now I'm going to make this y super bold right here, because it's not always y. And it's not always x. If you don't rotate about the axis, that changes. So our problem, we didn't rotate about the y-axis, so we didn't get y. What did we get? Oh, man. Oh, no. This is very wrong. Those are, yeah, so I messed up the, the first one was x-axis, the second one was y-axis. So we almost got this right here. The only difference is we didn't get x. What did we get? X plus 1. X plus 1. Why is that? Because our radius wasn't our x value. It was, we didn't rotate about, if I rotate about the y-axis, it would have been x. But we rotated one further away. So it won't always be just x. Sometimes it'll be x plus some offset. Um, if my radius was, if my rotating axis was way over here, I'd have to be a little more careful. It would be the big, so it'd be like 7 or 8 minus x. So that x is not always going to be uh, just x. If you don't rotate about the, x ac or the actual axis, you have to be very careful about what goes in there. Let's see if they'll let me undo all this. That is why down here, I made those super bold.
So these will change. So they'll change when not rotating about the axis. So if you ro rotate an, as an offset from the axis, you have to count that offset in your radius. The good news is if you draw pictures of what things are, just like we did in the washer section, you can see your radius pretty clearly. So we'll put both of these in a box. These are useful. If I was writing my cheat sheet, I would probably just go with this first one right here because it covers all the bases. So you don't need both on your cheat sheet. So you only need one of those boxes on your cheat sheet.